Let's talk a little bit about the properties of rocks. There's an entire field called geomechanics that looks at how rocks behave under extreme pressure. And we're going to talk a little bit about the properties of those rocks today using a few foods in the kitchen. The first thing we can do is divide rocks in all materials into two basic types. One is elastic and non-elastic. Elastic materials behave in a certain way. When you apply a force to them, like this meat stick, they return back into the original shape that they had. So I apply that force and it bounces back. We call that elastic behavior. Many foods and rocks in the world don't behave elastically though. They behave non-elastically. That means that they don't return to their original position if you deform them or you add stress to them. That happens in two different ways. The first way we describe one type of behavior is that it is brittle behavior. Okay, so if we take some of these uh, potato crisps, we kind of dump them out here, okay? What we'll do is we're going to apply a stress <coughs> to these and see how they behave. Now they're either going to break or they're going to bend, okay? Go ahead and break these and wow, these break into a thousand pieces, okay? That is brittle behavior. It's behavior where the rock shatters, it breaks cleanly. The atoms don't stretch or spin or mold or do anything other than just tear apart. We call that brittle behavior. Many rocks, especially at the Earth's surface, behave brittly. But under not all conditions do they behave brittly. The other way they may behave is ductily. Ductile materials are materials that when we apply a stress to them, let me go ahead and take this wrapper off this piece of taffy. Let's say this is our piece of rock, and now we apply a stress to it, and this actually bends and deforms. Okay, we call that ductile behavior. Okay, so those are the two various ways that rocks or any material may deform when we apply a stress to them. In, in the case of rocks, it really depends on what the environment is like. If it's under very high pressure, if it's under very high temperature, those atoms are able to connect together longer and basically deform without losing all the integrity. So they behave more ductily versus more brittly. There's another concept that really goes along with this called stress and strain. Anytime I apply a pressure, whether it's through a continent collision or through burying a rock deep underground, we call that a stress. If I take my taffy and I push down on it, I am applying a stress to that rock. Now I've got a rock that looks a lot different. We say that that rock has been strained. Okay, the strain is the result of the stress that we've applied. And not all rocks strain the same way. Some are very strong. Some behave brittly and break. Others smear and smush and make waves. You can demonstrate this right here in the kitchen if you stack some of the taffy together and then take just a couple of flat surfaces. And now this taffy is cool because it actually has two colors. It has the inside color, little round spots, and what you'll see as you deform this is those little round spots take on more elongated shapes. So we can apply several different types of stresses to this taffy. The first one is compressional stress, and that is where we take our two boards and we squeeze them together towards each other. That will actually cause the taffy to deform. It'll make the block longer, in this direction and shorter in this direction and now you can see some of our pink blobs aren't circular anymore they're now ellipsoid or ellipses and they're oriented or what we call orthogonally or perpendicularly to the stress that I was applying so geologists can use those types of clues in the rock to tell where the stress might have been coming from that caused the rock to deform now this we can also add a stress that is a, not so much squeezing, but more of what we call shearing, which is where we're going to move this way. Okay, so think about this like a rotation. 
So as we move this, and we're going to rotate those little blobs. Now, those little blobs are not only elongated, but now they started to turn because they're feeling the stress of those plates moving around. And this is how we get transform faults. It's because eventually those two halves of the rock will break. As a matter of fact, we can see right here we can already see a fault that's formed where this part of the rock is pulling away from this side of the rock. We call this a strike slip fault or a shear fault. And we can see little breaks in the rock at 45 degrees. And that's another set of fractures that form in the rock. So a geologist can look at all these clues. Where are the breaks in the rock? What does the rock look like? To understand what this motion was, the stress that caused it to deform. This is why rocks look so amazingly complex in nature. There's a third type of stress that we can apply to see how this rock will deform in nature. We've applied a compressional stress that squeezes, and we've applied a shear stress that rotates. Now we can apply a tensional stress that pulls apart. Now I've moved our block of taffy on the edge of two different cutting boards you can easily do this, but I recommend you take a third one and you put it on top and just press down because we want it to really sink in and join up with the um, cutting board below. Okay, and then we gently pull that off. You kind of see how it looks. Pretty cool. And we're, what we're going to do is simulate what would happen, say, in a rift valley or in some kind of a t divergent plate boundary setting where two plates are pulling apart. And you just take these and gently start to pull. Okay, and you can see now that it starts to stretch and move. You can see the pink areas in between are starting to elongate. The rock hasn't necessarily broken yet because it's behaving doctally. So this is how rocks that are deep within the earth are flowing and moving as plates pull apart and away from each other. Now eventually we'll get so far apart that the rock will, will break and also at this point, what could happen is those plates could shift, right? And so I can get even more complex deformation in the rocks, right? And so I might, as a geologist, end up with something that looks like this, you know, a little tail piece of it. That might be the clue as to the complex history of things that happened to give me these two separate blocks of rock that look like they could fit together, but are in two completely different positions. Geologists can look at these complex motions and events through time and piece back together the history of the Earth. In fact, things exactly like this, where we have one continent, let's say my cutting board's a continent here and a different one here, I can see the same type of rock in two different places. This is a key piece of evidence that at one time the continents fit back together. That's an evidence that the plates are in motion. The plate tectonics theory is an actual accurate model of how the Earth's crust works. And so you can try this in your own classroom. It's a great way to see just how complex the motions of the Earth really are. Mm -hmm.